what, what I'm going to be sharing tonight um, is actually the beginning of a three-part message, but um, we'll see where the Lord takes us tonight. And um, <coughs> the subject tonight is what is true. And so the Lord's just really been, this message in the next couple of weeks, um, although we won't be meeting We'll be meeting here next week, but it won't be a Judas more raw meeting. Um, the Brazilian church that meets here on um, Sunday nights, I think, is having a conference. So we are all coming to this. So I'm excited for that, to network with a, another fellowship here and get to know them and participate in what they're doing. At the beginning of the, um, let me see, in February, a word came out from Lance Walnut. And it said this, here in the United States, the winds are blowing with the, such hostility and contempt toward Christians at things uh, that are said against believers that would never be said against a Muslim or a minority. Even notice the rooster on the weather vane, it's there because Pope Nicholas I decreed in the 9th century that all churches must show the symbol of a rooster on its dome or stupel as a symbol of Jesus' prophecy of Jesus' betrayal in Luke 22, 34. It was a reminder that the fixed laws of north, south, east, and west will not change or move even when the winds of persecution can cause us to bend with the times. When the church has no fixed, absolute biblical truth on which it stands, when it has no line in the sand truths, and it has ceased to be the force withstanding the gates of hell on earth. The danger is this. When the church is reduced to a goodwill humanitarian organization with a Christian philosophy, that's what happens if we don't have absolute truths. If we just become the next good work out there. Rick Renner says it's no secret that the spiritual environment in the world is undergoing a radical change and a great gulf is beginning to, to divide those who are making a way from moving away from established truth in those who <coughs> see what is happening and are responding by making personal recommitments to absolute truth. <coughs> and so what we're going to be doing is unfolding two, actually three things. This, the whole subject is about the realm of I am. The Lord really began to speak to me about this realm, the realm of I am. And so that's where I've just been meditating and being with him for the past probably eight weeks or so, which is since the beginning of the year, I guess it's the end of March, so for three months. And from that place, this is what I'm going to be speaking on the next few weeks. Um, and tonight is really about what is truth. And that really is a question that the world is asking. What is truth? What is truth? There's lots of truths. But I'm not talking truths, I'm talking what is truth. Um, there's lots of opinion, opinion on what truths are, but we're going to unfold it, obviously, the word of God tonight. And so we're going to look at some really um, very familiar passages. What I'm sharing tonight is nothing new. But one thing I've learned, learned from Rick Joyner, who is my spiritual father, is you must continue to look at the foundations. You must make sure the foundations of your faith are rock solid. And there's not no sand getting in that you absolutely know where both feet are standing and it's on rock solid ground because the hour that we are in right now, we must be standing on the bedrock of the truth of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he says and what we're called to. So in John 18, 28 to 38, I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation. I'm going to read those passages and then we're going to begin to unfold it. Before dawn, they took Jesus from his trial before Caiaphas to the Roman governor's palace. The Jews refused to go into the Roman governor's residence to avoid ceremonial defilement before eating the Passover meal. So Pilate came outside where they waited and asked him pointedly, Tell me what exactly is the accusation that you bring against this man? What has he done? And they answered, we wouldn't be coming here to hand over this criminal to you if he wasn't guilty of some wrongdoing. Pilate said, very well then, you take him yourselves and go pass judgment on him according to your Jewish laws. But the Jewish leaders complained and said, we don't have legal authority to put anyone to death. You should have him crucified. Upon hearing this, Pilate went back inside his palace, summoned Jesus, looking him over, and Pilate said, 
Are you really the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, are you asking because you really want to know? Or are you only asking this because others have said it about me? And Pilate responded, only a Jew would care about this. Do I look like a Jew? It's your own people and your religious leaders who have handed you over to me. So tell me, Jesus, what have you done wrong? And Jesus looked at Pilate and said, the royal power of my kingdom does not come from this world. If it did, then my followers would be fighting to the end to defend me from the Jewish leaders. My kingdom authority is not from this realm. Then Pilate responded, oh, so then you're a king. You are right, Jesus said. I was born a king. I have come into this world to prove what truth really is. Everyone who loves the truth will receive my words. And Pilate looked at Jesus and said, what? is true. And the point of this is, is that the author, he said, I'm the author. I'm not from this realm. What is truth? The first truth that he said is the royal power of my kingdom doesn't come from this world. My kingdom authority is not from this realm. I was born a king. And I came to prove what truth is. He actually is truth. Jesus is truth. What is truth? Jesus is truth. What is the realm of I am? The realm of I am is the truth of his kingdom. That's one of the things we're going to unfold it in the weeks ahead. The realm of I am is vast. It's vast what it is when you really meditate on it, contemplate on it. And so, who is truth? We're going to look at it through... Um, various passages here and there, and I'm going to unfold it in a little bit different way. In the Song of Songs, it says this, How beautiful you are. I am not disappointed with you. I am delighted in you, even in your struggles, even when you're in your weakest place. He just looks over, looks into our eyes and said, I'm not disappointed in you at all. In fact, I'm totally delighted in you. You see, this is truth. This is a foundational truth to our walk. If we don't fully grasp that he is delighted in us, that he is not disappointed in us, we will have all kinds of emotions, all kinds of things stir in us whenever the slightest thing happens. And God is looking to bring us in this hour because the father of lies who is the one that is the father of the orphan spirit. All he does is combat us day and night if we listen to him with the lies of who we are, what our identity is. And this is true. This is the battle that we're in. The battle is always for the mind and the emotions. And the enemy comes with lies up about our identity. And so the foundation is Jesus' truth. And another foundation of truth is we are beautiful to him. And so the one who is truth wants us to live from the realms of heaven how he sees us and what he says about us. That's critical. You can say, I know that. Do you know it? What happens when an offense comes your way? What comes up? Do you follow what I'm saying? It's, he's going, when, we, when things come up, it's because he's going after foundations in us. Brian Simmons says this, What pleasure floods Jesus Christ as you break your heart open to him and give him the treasures of your worship? How can you say your life is not significant if you understand that the purpose of your life is to give him pleasure? How can you say your life is not significant? So the truth that I'm going after here is the truth of our significance. Because it's the next place that the enemy comes. What's your worth? What's your value? You don't fit. What are you doing here? I mean, the amazing thing is if he can keep us from communicating with each other, then he can actually pull it off. Because when we communicate with each other, we'll find out he's using the same broken record, the same CD, the same DVD. Because he's not creative. All he can do is use the same lines over and over again. 
And so we break down the lie of insignificance with the truth of that we are, t we are as his treasures and our worship to him. Oh my gosh. It brings him delight. He says he's the one who delights in us and we live from that foundation. So again, we live from the foundation. He delights in us. And that doesn't change. That is unchanging. He delights in us. Then there's the truth about um, being with Jesus. The truth of the fruit of being with Jesus. Somebody can say, well, why do you spend that time with Jesus? Why do you take that time with Jesus? You could be doing this. You could be doing that. There's so much to do. <coughs> Actually, we don't accomplish much or anything that's lasting without being with Jesus. So the truth of what happens when we're with Jesus, it says Peter and John in Acts 4.13. Peter and John were arrested. They were arrested because there was a man at the gate, beautiful, who was crippled and was healed. And so all the religious leaders, everybody's flipping out. Everybody, the spirit of jealousy, the spirit of religion, every um, the magistrates, the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the elders, they're all there. Everybody's there. The rulers of the people, they all are brought before all of them. In Acts 4, 13, it says this. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, that says they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So here they are, they're arrested, they're brought before all of these rulers, all of these leaders, scribes, elders, magistrates, and they're astonished. They're like, what? These are just ordinary men. They haven't been schooled like we've been schooled. What? How can they talk like this? How can they have this courage? What is it? What did they see? What they saw was courage. What they saw was no fear. What they saw was focus. What they saw was devotion to Jesus. What they saw was boldness. Unfettered eloquence. What did they realize? They realized that they could not contradict anything that they were saying because the proof was standing there next to them. A man who had been crippled at the gate, who was leaping and dancing and, and shouting praises. They could not deny it. They couldn't argue it. That this was an extraordinary miracle. How is this possible? Why were they astonished? What I just said. These were fishermen, unschooled, untrained in the ways of speaking with the type of eloquence that they came forth with. But their hearts were on fire. Their hearts were ablaze with a deep conviction, and they were unstoppable. Because it wasn't about politics, it wasn't about the law, it wasn't about religion, it was about a king and a kingdom. The one who is truth. And they carried this truth deep in their hearts with a fire. And what it was, it was the fruit of being with Jesus. That's what they saw. The fruit of being with Jesus. And this is what our lives, this is what the truth of our lives is to bring forth. The fruit of being with Jesus. But they'll say, what? I mean, I don't have, I personally don't have a bachelor's degree, which means I certainly don't have a master's degree or an MDiv or a PhD or anything. I've gone to ministry school. The only thing I can say is I've been with Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. I, there's nothing really to impress anybody. There's the only thing that you could be impressed with is if there's any presence of God with me. And I don't say that tritely, and I don't say it with self, with false humility. I say it. It's truth. Um, but that's the truth, the truth of being with Jesus in his presence. What do we bring forth? The deep conviction of our hearts, of who it is we serve. The next truth I want to talk about is the truth about holiness. The real truth about holiness. Because most people when they hear holiness, particularly in the world, it's like, oh, that means like no makeup, you know, I don't know, you know, you, I don't know, you know, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And there are many things that I don't do. Um, but it's not from a place of legalism or law, it's from places because 
Jesus has captured my heart. And so I want to um, take a, a few things, a few passages here again from, um, from where? I'm in the wrong place. Here we go. From uh, Bob Jones. And it's really amazing because I'm, I don't have the time to go through this four pages, but this is from a visitation he had with the Lord and with the Lord. The Lord took him to the enemy's trophy room in the second heaven. It's not a place you go by yourself if the Lord doesn't take you there. You don't want to go into the second heaven because that's where the enemy's camp is. But the Lord brought him there. And I'm going to read this. While Bob was observing the enemy's tent with the Lord, he knew he was called to take back something that had a tremendous um, value for the church. Actually, this was placed in the heart of Satan, in the heart of Satan's trophy room. See, there were many things that we talked about before that, musical instruments, gifts, books, all kinds of things that are in people's mantles, There's tons of things in the enemy's trophy room. The room was full of things that Satan considered very valuable, but in his calling, the Lord intended that he would restore only one ab object. <coughs> This object provided an extremely important heritage that is the basis for granting all abilities and all power. It is our calling and a command that we live in a sanctified state of life. And after entering into that state, the Lord guided Bob to a table covered with the black velvety fabric. Then he saw a banner of God, which, is, um, which he is desiring to be restored to the church. This banner was preserved by the enemy as an important object, and it was the banner of holiness. For a long time, Satan had persuaded the church how impossible it is to live a pure and holy life. In the most important location of Satan's trophy room was this white banner, embroidered in blue, that expressed a core spiritual truth. The gold writing on the banner was written, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And the enemy has stolen holiness from the church, and now the Lord is wanting this truth to be restored. Bob grabbed the banner and left that dark room with the Lord, and as Bob held on to the banner from the table, he expressed, All hell broke loose. But the Lord immediately brought Bob out of the trophies room and hit him at the sheep gate. But in Bob's hand was the banner. Now I could go on, there's just this four pages here I could preach from from the whole night. The things that are in the trophy room that Satan has stolen from the body of Christ. But the banner of holiness was taken out of that trophy room. The most sacred object that Satan coveted. And God is restoring and calling us as his people to the place of holiness out of pure devotion and um, <clears throat> truths are being restored by truth himself. That's what's happening. Truths are being restored by the person of truth himself and the truth about holiness. And so that's a whole passage and message in itself. Everything I'm teaching on tonight, I could, I could do a whole message at every single point. Um, but that's not what I'm here to do tonight. And so, there is a quote by, and I'm touching on different things, because he unfolded this through various things he spoke to me and various things he's spoken to other people in the body of Christ. It was a quote I came upon by a woman by the name of Donna uh, Pato, and she says this, Nothing betrays the condition of the, your heart as readily as the words you speak. And that's a truth. We can make excuses for what comes out of our mouth, but truly, the over what comes out of our mouth is the overflow of our heart. So we can catch ourselves and say, oh, I didn't really mean that. Well, it's the overflow of your heart. What comes out? The Word of God isn't saying, well, it's maybe the overflow of your heart when you've got, you know, and you've had too much caffeine or something, or you haven't had enough sleep. No, it's the overflow of your heart, period. And so, um, here's, a, here's a couple of points for us in this. And I, I, it may sound like I'm going all over the place, but I'm really not. I've always said I'm not a three-point, that's what I, I don't do that. I, I 
give what God tells me to. My goal is to be a messenger of his heart. I posture myself to hear what's on his heart for us. And that's all I know to bring forth. I'm not trying to be eloquent. I'm trying to hear his voice and his heart and bring that forth. Because other than that, it doesn't have any substance, not, at least not for me. So, okay, as you interact with people, what are, what are they talking about? Is all they talking about their boyfriend or their kids? And it's because that's what their main focus is. All these things are good. I'm going someplace here. Okay, if you, all they do is talk about other people, well, that's not good because then you're talking about it's just all gossip. So you know what their time is spent. If all they talk about is the latest TV shows that they watch, then you know they spend an awful lot of time on TV. Um, if all they talk about is their latest ordeal, it's always the latest ordeal, then it's spending way too much time on themselves. But if they talk to you about what God is speaking to them, then you know that their time has been spent with the Lord. Now, obviously, kids are important. You watch a TV program. I'm not going to, you understand what I'm saying? But what is it we talk about? What is our conversation? What's the overflow of our heart? Where are we spending our time? And I love the prayer here. It says, Dear Lord, I want to have the courage of Peter and John that when people look at my life and realize that there's nothing spectacular in me other than the presence of the living God, that is, I want them to be astonished. I want it to be evident to all that everything good that happens in my life and through my life is because I walk with you, Lord. And after I talk with people, I want them to take note that I have been with Jesus. When we talk with people, what do we leave them with? Who have they been? What's different about that person? What is it that I can't wait to talk with them again? What is it that they carry? What is it about that person? What's emanating from them? In John 19, the Jewish leaders... Um, said to Pilate that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He said they, he claimed to be the Son of God. Now that was a heresy to them. And Pilate asked Jesus, where have you come from? It's the great question that Pilate wanted to know. Where have you come from, Jesus? Kingdom that not of this world, it's not of this realm, not a king of this realm. And the Jews really, the Jewish leaders, really flipped out when on the cross, um, what he wrote over the cross, King of the Jews, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. I loved what Brian Simmons put in a subnote with this. It says this, what it actually wrote, he wrote was Y-H-W-H. <laughs> it was written Aramaic and Hebrew. And he said, to write these letters, the Hebrew sacred name, it was Yahweh. And so that's literally what he wrote. Y-H-W-H. He wrote Yahweh. That was the greatest offense possible. And basically it was Yahweh, God the Savior, bled to death for God, the Savior, bled to death for each one of us. Yeah. Who are you? This is who I am. Yahweh, the one true living God. There is no other God. This is absolute truth. It's not maybe. It's not possible. He's not one of the prophets. He's the prophet. And this is the truth. The day that we are living in, this truth will be challenged. And if we are not bedrock solid, unshakable, no matter what argument comes at us, right now as we're standing here, there are people who are dying in China, Africa, Korea, 
for their faith. Nations all over the world, as we are standing here right now, this very second, next second, next second, next second, next second, five seconds, there's five people that have just died for their faith. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is the truth. That's truth. In this country, at this point, people aren't being martyred for their faith. It looks different for us. It's a different type of persecution. But will we back away? Will we water our faith down at the lunch table at work? I'll tell you what, the movie, God is Not Dead, if you haven't seen it, see it. And tell every unsaved friend that you know to go see it. I was so touched by that movie and by that young man in college who stood against a, a philosophy professor and brought the truth of the gospel. Powerful. What a powerful, powerful, powerful movie. Um, so the truth of he is Yahweh. It's the truth I'm making there. The point I'm making there is the truth is he is Yahweh. It was offensive then, and it's offensive now. So you can go out and use the word God, you can use the word creator, and you can find all <coughs> kinds of people that agree with you. But the minute you use Yeshua, Yahweh, Jesus Christ, you've just changed the whole atmosphere. Because every time we speak the name Jesus, there's an atmosphere shift. Every single time. You can't say the name Jesus without it impacting something. You can't mention the power of his blood without it impacting the atmosphere. So the next truth I want to look at is he is righteousness. And we are robed in his righteousness. Really, really important. Because if we don't bedrock solid believe that, then the enemy comes and says prove it. Prove it. Prove it. Look, you just blew it again. Prove it. And we beat ourselves up when we fail. But we are clothed in his righteousness. It's by the blood of the Lamb we have access to Jesus Christ. We have access to the Father. We have access to the throne. We have access to the heavens by the blood of the Lamb. His righteousness. We can say, oh yeah, we know that. Do we? When the enemy comes and whispers in our ear, what, who responds is the truth that we are robed, covered completely in the one seamless garment. They did not. They cast dice for his robe. It was one seamless garment. We are robed in one seamless garment of his love, of his righteousness, purchased with his blood. It was the emblem, the one seamless garment was the emblem of perfect holiness. And he's saying, let me robe you, let me adorn you, your mind, your soul, your will, your emotions, all of your being. Let me adorn you afresh in the truth that you are robed in one seamless robe of my righteousness. And let it be a banner of truth to every lie that the enemy would come and say, you can't, you won't, you don't have access, you're not worthy, and on and on and on and on and on. The truth is what cancels out the lies every single time. It is the Father and the Son of Truth and the Kingdom of Light versus the Kingdom of Darkness, the Father of Lies. It is a war. And there are two kingdoms. Only two. There's not ten, there's not twelve, there's not three, there's two. You're either in light or you're in darkness. There is no such thing as gray. There is no gray kingdom. It's light and darkness and they're in conflict. They're clashing. And I won't apologize for the truth. I don't try to shove it down somebody's throat. It's here it is, accept it or not. When it was presented to me, I either accepted it or I didn't. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because it's the truth of his love. It's the truth of his amazing grace. It's the truth, my gosh, to walk in his righteousness. We don't deserve it. It's a gift. My goodness, when think about that, it's so amazing. So the truth that we are robed in this amazing righteousness, it's a gift from God. The next truth I want to allow is the 
truth that he's the victor over death. You know, Mary was the first one that went to the tomb that Jesus was put in. And she went in and he wasn't there. And she goes back and she tells the disciples, they've taken his body, I don't know who's taken it, where they put him. And so Peter and John, we know it well, run to the tomb. And John eventually goes in and he takes one look. It says, after one look, he believed. One look. What did he see? He saw a linen cloth lying there, a burial cloth rolled up. I've taught this before, I'll teach it again. The way that he folded, the way that he folded the burial cloth, the way that it was, it was a tradition in the Jewish, in the Jewish culture when they didn't like a meal. They didn't say to the hostess, I don't like your meal. They folded the napkin in a way that said, I will never eat here again. He folded it in a way that said, I have conquered death, hell, and the grave. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Conquered. Never, ever. No one who believes in me will ever have to eat at this table because you will have eternal life. We are, for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we are eternal beings now. We never have to taste death. It's been conquered. That's what John saw. That's what John saw. He saw the victory over death. That Jesus was the victor over death. This is the truth. The victor over death. We don't die. If we're born again, we never die. We are eternal beings. Now, right now, this very moment. We are. So the truth about Jesus is um, our teacher. I want to go back to Mary in John 20. It said Mary didn't realize it was him. She's back at the garden, she, and all of a sudden Jesus is there. She doesn't know it's him. And she's asking him, do you know? Are you, she thought he was the gardener. Do you know where they've taken him? Until he, until he spoke. And as soon as he spoke, she knew who it was. Raboni, teacher! She knew exactly why, because this was Mary who sat at his feet and knew his voice. She knew his voice. We're going to look at that in depth in a couple of weeks. But she knew his voice. That is so key. Because the voice of the stranger, which is the devil, the voice of the stranger, is always seeking to get our attention. He never shuts up. Never. Unless we tell him to. He's always there. There's plenty to say, and it's all lies. Every single thing is a lie. So it's important, it's imperative, in this hour that we know his voice more than any... I'll tell you, I am absolutely convinced that it is the most important thing that we can do right now in this hour as his people, is to know his voice. Because there are so many voices clamoring, go this way, go that way, the voice of reason, the voice of this, the voice of that, the voice of the world, do this, do this, do this, do this. This is what you should do with your finances. This is what you should do for work. This is where you should live. This is where you should go. This is what you should do for ministry. This is what you should do with the da, 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 da. I mean, there are so many voices that come at you. And the voice that's supposed to be leading us is the voice of the Lord. What has the Lord told you to do? Well, I think, no. What has the voice of the Lord. Well, I think, what has the voice of the Lord told you to do? Jesus said, I never did anything unless the Father told me. Many things
things we call the devil are not the devil at all. It's because we did not sit and wait for the voice of the Lord. We presumed, and there's consequences when we just go our own way. He still loves us, but there's far too many things blaming the devil that's not the devil at all. It's our choices. It's our free will that he gives us. You can do whatever you want, but if you wait for my voice, it's wisdom. It's wisdom. Time to get back into the book of Proverbs. So, truth. The next truth is, he is peace. Now, now we're in John, and we're in verse 2019. And they're in the upper room, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're, they're, no, they're in this room, they're in the room, and they're not in the upper room. They're, in, they're waiting behind locked doors, and it says they're in fear. Even after seeing Jesus. He's already appeared to them once. Now, here he, here he is, here they are hiding. There's no peace. They're afraid of the reprisals of the Jewish leaders. There's, and there they are now. We may have done the same thing. I don't know. I'm not judging them. I'm just telling them what the, what the Word of God says. This is what the Word of God says. I have no opinion on it. I wasn't there. I know what fear can do. We may not be locked behind closed doors, but do we have places in our hearts that we have locked him out? Or that we have locked others out? Places that are just filled with fear and anxiety that he wants to come and say peace? Like when he came into the room, just appeared to them, walked through the walls and said peace to you? That's what he did came and said to them, not what are you doing, why are you afraid, what's wrong, what's the matter with you, I've walked it, I've walked with you for three years, don't you get it? That's not what he said. He came and he said, peace to you. And this is what he's still saying to us today. He doesn't say, what's the matter with you, why are you afraid? He says, peace. I'm knocking at your door. I just open the door, let me in. Here I am. I just want to be with you. I just want to speak peace to your heart because I am peace. The truth of it is, it's actually better than that. He actually is inside of us because the person of, he is peace. And when we accept him into our hearts, we know this is all foundational things. This is foundation I'm teaching. This is nothing new. But the question is, how deep are we walking in these foundations? People want to say, oh, I want to go with the angels to the galaxies. I want to go through portals. I want to see everything. I want to see the, I want to, I'm like, really? Do you have peace? Mm -hmm. Do you have peace? More important than seeing open heavens, I'll tell you right now, is peace. stuff, don't get me wrong, but the, I see a lot of people pursuing a lot of things and I don't see peace in their eyes and I don't see peace in their hearts. It's like, oh my God, I haven't seen an angel like that person over in the front of me. But that doesn't really matter. The one who is peace is inside of you. This place of peace and truth and wisdom and holiness, I'll tell you, God is really after these things. He's really after these things in our lives. So then, um, so he's the one um, that it says in John, I'm going to read this part of it, because I really want to, um, it's so powerful. The Word of God is just so amazing. I just love it. You know, you sit, you sit and it's like, he just breathes the word into you as you read it. It's like, oh my God, this is so amazing. What other book can do it? You know, this is alive. It's alive. I can't wait to be in the word. It's like, wow, what are you going to speak? I sit there and I go, Peter, come on now. I go, come on now, God. This is amazing. <laughs> come on. I'm like, wow. I just like want to be an eagle and soar through the sky and scream it everywhere. But anyways, <laughs> um, 
Jesus repeated his greeting, saying, Peace to you. And he told them, Just as the Father has sent me, I'm now sending you. Then, taking a deep breath, I mean, you got to picture this, taking a deep breath, he blew on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Come on now. Wow. I did feel him breathe on me once as the lion, and I'll tell you what, you don't forget it. I send you to preach the forgiveness of sins, and people's sins will be forgiven. But if you don't proclaim the forgiveness of their sins, they will remain guilty. So, the other verb, what it actually says there in the Aramaic is, accept the sacred breath. Come on, I, I read that and I'm like, okay, you just can't hear for a year. Accept the sacred breath. Well, then he says, immediately I send you to preach forgiveness. So, the sacred breath isn't just about, well, we're just going to lie here and receive his sacred breath. Come on, Jesus, blow on me again just because it feels good. No. He blew on them because there was a purpose. There was a commission. Now I'm sending you out to the nations to preach the gospel. I'll breathe it into you, my very being, my very resurrection breath. I'm breathing into you the sacred breath. I'm breathing into you the resurrection power. When he breathes on us, he's breathing on us resurrection power. The dunamis to go out to the nations. The dunamis to cross the street to your neighbor. To talk to the person at the next desk that sits next to you. Whatever your situation is, it's not just to take, 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 take for ourselves. If we are to, we receive and we give. He breathes in, we breathe out. He breathes in, we breathe out. He breathes in, he breathe, we breathe out. The resurrection power and the life. It's a posture. We posture ourselves to receive. So, you know, I love when you, God gives you this stuff and then he confirms it. It's like, oh, I'm reading in the shepherd's rod, da 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 now it's, I'm on page 70. Okay? I love how he ties it all in. And this is Bob Jones, Shepherd's Rod, 2014. So, when he says, this is the year, it's because he's prophesying for 2014. This is the year when we begin to see resurrection power. I was shown resurrection life likened to that of Lazarus when the Lord called him by name. Life came back into his dead body when the breath of the Lord filled the air. And the Lord called Lazarus by name because had we only said come forth, all the dead bodies in that tomb would have risen. He said, I believe this vision is talking of two different things. First, I feel the Father is calling our names once again. For some, it is an awakening to salvation. And for others, it will awaken them from a spiritual stupor. Secondly, I believe it's a type and shadow of the things to come. To those who believe, they will be given the opportunity to raise the dead to life by calling their name and commanding them to come forth. Now it goes on, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go on with the rest of it. But I will say, here's why we must know the truth. Now, I am so grateful for the movies that are coming out, like the one I just talked about, God is Not Dead, um, Heaven is Real, that's coming out very soon, awesome, true story about the little boy, and um, the other one that I haven't seen, The Son of God. Now, I know my sister told me that she went to see it, and she said there was, done, there was one scene that... It didn't follow what the Bible said, which was when Jesus stood before the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. What I just said. You see, he didn't go into the tomb like a portrayed. He spoke it. And for that to be watered down, to make it user-friendly, to change that part, do you understand by what I just read? Both in the passage, receive the sacred breath, in the prophetic word about his resurrection breath and what it does and the power of it, that if he didn't say Lazarus, everybody would have come up and out? That's major. As soon as she said that part to me, something inside of me went, Rrr! and not from a place.
place of legalism or judgment or criticism because it was the truth watered down. One of the most important truths, the resurrection breath, that breath that said, let there be light. And there was that breath that, breath that said, let there be life. Let there be trees. Let there be stars. Let there be oceans. Let there be rivers. That cannot be watered down. That is absolutely true. The creator, the created world, the galaxies, the stars, created by his breath, by his words. That is the, you know, I'm not going to get ahead of myself, what happened at the cross, but it is the breath, the sacred breath, the sacred words of Jesus Christ. So you see, it would be very easy to be quiet, would it not? You're sitting at lunch at work, and you're talking about that movie, and somebody says, well, you know, that, you know, he, he, well, we'd heard that he spoke to it, but the, the movie said that he went in. What do you do at that moment? So use a friend that's keep the lunch table quiet? Do you want to be singled out? Or do we say, well, you know, the truth is, the truth is, you, un you understand? Out of love. Because love wants to speak the truth. And we speak the truth in love. Um, revelation. This wasn't something that happened here. It was the overflow that spilled out of his heart. Who do you say I am, Thomas? You are my Lord. You are my God. It says in verse 31, so that you will fully believe that Jesus is the anointed one, the Son of God. Fully believe. Because when we fully believe with every core of our being, no matter what comes our way, we'll never shrink back. When we wait for him in his presence, for him to blow his sacred breath on us, the Holy Spirit, what happens is we become unstoppable. We become so filled with this bold, brave courage that comes from the heart of the one who breathes on us as we spend time with him. And from that, we can scale a wall, leap a truth, we can do anything. John 21, he, there he is, <clears throat> Peter and John, and there's seven of them all together, who are supposed to be waiting. 
Jerusalem. They're not. They're fishermen. <laughs> he said, go away. And they're fishing. They're not even where they're supposed to be. That's pretty amazing, number one. But he says to them, at dawn, when you really begin, to, you go through the New Testament, so much of what Jesus does is at dawn. It's amazing. At dawn, at dawn, at dawn, at dawn. So much with the Psalms, it's at dawn. So he says, at dawn, hey guys, did you catch any fish? This is from the Passion Translation. And they said no. He said, throw your net over the starboard side and you'll catch some. And they did. And it said they caught so many they could barely pull it in. You know this, it's very familiar. He said, throw your net, it says, in, to the starboard side. Now the starboard side of the boat is the right side. And the right side, prophetically, is the side of faith. We've done many things that we're familiar with. Many things of our own. If I'm saying, well, I know how to do this. I know how to fish. I know how to do this. I know how to worship. I know how to dance. I know how to write. I know how to paint. I know how to teach. I know how to do my job. I know how to... It's like, oh, well, you know, there's an invitation that the Lord is really telling us to throw our nets to the other side, the side of faith. And it's not reason. It's not self-reliance on going our way or not being where not supposed to be. They were supposed to be waiting in their fishing. And so, they ended up catching 153 fish. Now 153, Brian Simmons says this, equals the shadow of L. And 153 is um, Bethsalel. A, who was the man who crafted the Ark of the Covenant, who was the chief artisan of the tabernacle of Moses. The shadow of El. And Jesus comes in his love, and he comes with his presence, and he comes in the shadow of the Most High God. He comes and he actually covers them in his love. He didn't say, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be waiting. Did he say that? No. 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 He said, have you caught any fish? And then he tells them, throw it to the other side because he sees they're not catching anything. They're not catching anything because they're in disobedience. They know how to catch fish. He's showing them, you're not where you're supposed to be. You're not going to catch anything. So then he's, will they do it? Will they be obedient? Throw it to the other side. They did. They caught the fish. So then, there he is. He's the great pursuer, and suddenly their eyes are opened, and John says to Peter, it's the Lord, because now their eyes are opened. It's the Lord. And it's amazing to me, as I've read this, I don't know how many times, what I saw in this again, Lord, you are the dawn awakener. You came, and you awoke in the darkness of their, their disobedience, their, their whatever, whatever stupor they were in, you know, there he is, the great pursuer. He pursues them. It just, it, it blows me away how often he's pursued me, how often when it feels like it's nighttime in my soul and he comes as the dawn awakener and he says, hey, hey. <laughs> right, Jen? Hey. Hey. <laughs> I love it. He's awesome. He just comes. He's relentless. He pursues us relentlessly. Um, in the shepherd's rod again, I knew I'm doing a lot of referral to things, but there's none of, you know, I, I try to bring things. I don't know who's reading the shepherd's rod and who's not, but I really love the shepherd's rod because Bob Jones really, really hears from the Lord. I know for me, I really miss that spiritual father on this earth because he was one voice that I completely trusted. All you had to do was look in his eyes. I've, been, I've quite frankly never seen another person's eyes like his eyes, and I'm not elevating the man, it's because his life was so. He was in true union with Jesus. True union with Jesus. 
The anointing this year is on the first book of John. The book of 1 John. Everything we need for this year is in these chapters. John was called the apostle of love, so that is why his greatest emphasis is on love. God is love, and John understood this, and his relationship with, his, with Christ was in knowing that the Master loved him. The great importance he's driving home in 1 John 1 is intimacy with God. We must understand our position in God and not partake of the things of this world. Love God and know that he loves us, and then we must be vessels of his love demonstrating the Father's love in every area of our life to all peoples of every tongue, tribe, and nation. What is the truth? The truth is the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. And he's inviting us to understand our position in this love and to live in the world but not be of it and to walk in this love that is just astounding, amazing. And, um, he is the one that invites us into mature partnership. That's really important. Walking in a mature partnership. Walking in a place um, where we become so one with him that like in Song of Songs, she talks about, let us, let us go forth, let us go out um, to the ends of the earth and bring your message of love to those who have never heard before from this place of deep union with Jesus. She used to be actually distracted. She was distracted when, she, you know, the, at the even thought of needing to go out to the lost, even the thought of going out and sharing this love because she just wanted to be with Jesus. She just wanted her own little intimate time. She just wanted, I just want to be with you, Jesus. I just want to hear from you, Jesus. I just want to be in this place of being with you. I can just be with you. And he's like, no, that's not mature love. Mature love, true apostolic grace is the mature love, mature Christianity that it's it is sacred intimacy, but it's sacrificial ministry. It's sacrificial, it's sacred in intimacy, it's sacrificial ministry, and it's, there's a faithfulness even in the places that we suffer. Immature love is all about ourselves and what we can get for Jesus and how close we are to Jesus. That's for ourselves, but mature love is it takes what we receive and it just wants to lay your life down. You want to lavish, not just the Lord. Jesus went up the mountain every day. He came down the mountain. He went out. He didn't hang up there. He came down and he went out. And he went where the Father told him to go. And he said what the Father told him to say. When he met with the woman at the well, it was not a surprise. He knew. He was prepared. He had already talked on the top of the mountain with the Father. Jesus was not caught off guard. You understand? He was not caught off guard. He understood. And so the place of mature love is really because she loves him, she's willing to feed the lambs. She's willing to go out. She's willing to reach out. That is mature love. He's the one that invites us into mature partnership. We don't have to take it. He still loves us. He still loves us. If we just want to stay locked away. He still loves us. But the mature love, it comes outside the room that you meet in. It comes outside the four walls of the church, and it goes out into the world, into a lost and broken world with the message of what we have. Let me tell you of this one who is truth. I'm going to share a couple more truths. And um, we're going to be moving into something pretty sh shortly. We'll be doing communion. I love this. This to me, Loopy, I read this and I'm like, oh, come on, I wish I painted, <laughs> which I don't. This is Psalm 43, Passion Translation again, um, verse 3 through 4. Pour 
into me the brightness of your daybreak. Pour into me your rays of revelation truth. Let them comfort and gently lead me into the onto the shining path, showing the way into your burning presence, into your many sanctuaries of holiness. Then I will come closer to your very altar until I come before you, the God of my ecstatic joy, 